situation where Americans learned a possible hijack? Down? Yes. Why didn't he land? He did not land. He just wanted to know, can we just want you to know that I love you? Honestly, I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much. And I'm so sorry they... We're not here to die, but it's just bad. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. All right, this is where we're gonna start, at okay. least. Um, yeah, we could do it right here, I think. On the morning of September 11th, I was in my office when the first plane hit Tower One. We, um, I called the mayor, I told him I was coming. I would meet him at Tower 7. Tower 7 stood right here on this corner. Our command center was in the 23rd floor of Tower 7. So I took off downtown, and we actually came down West Broadway uh, toward Vesey Street. We we're gonna make a right on Vesey, and as we were, there were cops there, and a cop a sergeant came up to the car screaming that, you know, we couldn't turn onto the block, that people were jumping. And I didn't, it, I didn't understand what he said, and I got out of the vehicle. And uh, he said, he salutes me, and he says, Commissioner, they're, they're coming down, they're jumping. And I looked up and I could see debris coming off of the side of Tower One um, from 95 floors up. What I didn't realize until that debris got closer to the ground is that it was bodies. I think in that first probably five minutes I was there, um, I probably watched close to two or three dozen people come off the building. And they were hitting the ground, they were hitting the awnings between Tower 2 and Tower 1. Um, they sounded like explosions when they hit the metal. I couldn't get into New York City. All, all points of entry were closed down. Uh, and. My best friend from third grade, John Gomez, calls and he goes, are you watching this? I said, watch what? I just dropped my son off at nursery school, you know, and I went home, obviously. I knew instantly, I said, this is, I, I knew what it was. Terrorism is real. Evil exists. In the last century, a hundred million human souls were lost. And we dealt with, in that hundred year period, fascism, communism, uh, Nazism, Imperial Japan, the killing fields, Cambodia, Pol Pot, and, but all told, based on the history, a hundred million souls are killed in the name of governments, in the name of some ism. The ism that we deal with now is terrorism. Um, about three minutes before the mayor got here, there was this enormous explosion and we looked up, and the second plane was slamming through the north side of the building on top of us. Another one just hit the building. Wow. Wow. Another one just hit it hard. Another one just hit the world state. That's when I realized we were under attack. My staff, the bodyguards, we went behind Tower 7. We waited for the debris to come down. And um, Mayor Giuliani arrived about three minutes later. Looked at the damage here. The mayor wanted to go down to West Street, so we actually walked down to West Street here, went to the side of the buildings, and to a temporary command post, we met with the first deputy commissioner, the chief of department, chief of operations from the fire department. We talked to them for about 10 minutes, and the mayor, he said, okay, I wanna, I wanna go back to the other side here, um, and, and where I was gonna set up a temporary command post here. We came back up the block, and my guys had secured an office in that building. 
there, there was a Merrill Lynch office there, a small Merrill Lynch office. We were going to go in there. The mayor was going to call the White House. He wanted to speak to the president about getting air support. Walked into that office. The mayor sat down at a desk, uh, got on the phone, uh, got through to the White House. Somebody came on the phone. They said, the president's not here. The vice president is going to come to the phone and talk to you. And about a minute and a half after they said that, um, they came back on the phone and they said, we have to go. Um, they're evacuating the White House and we think that the Pentagon just got hit. And the mayor hung up and he said, that's not good. And he told me what they said. And all of a sudden, the building started shaking like a freight train was coming through the side of it. Somebody kicked open the door and yelled, it's coming down. And um, that's when Tower 2 was imploding. On the morning of 9-11, I actually was in my dorm room and uh, we watched it on TV. I went to class, I came back, we kind of saw what was going on. And my father was a, a fireman at the time in Rescue 4, so we knew he was working that day, but I didn't know exactly you know, where he was the morning of. I called my mother, I said, you know, is, is dad working today? And she said, yeah, he's, he's working. I haven't heard from him yet, but I'll call you back later. And no one really knew what to do because there wasn't a moment of exasperation where you're like, oh, this is, it's over. Like, we know he's gone. It was kind of, it, he still might walk in the door. Every time the door opened, everyone would turn and say, oh, you know, expect him to kind of walk in. Um, and again, another day, another day. And then kind of over, over the course of that week, it just, we kind of eased into, he's not coming back. Like, we, we're pretty sure that uh, he was lost in the, in the collapse. When the building came down, um, once that building started to shake, um, we had, it blew out all the windows. There was smoke and gas and, and all this stuff. I remember thinking, uh, you know, we were in there. There was no way out, couldn't get out. Um, couldn't go out the way we came in. It was all blocked off. So, you know, and, you, and we couldn't breathe, which was the worst part of it. Uh, and I was thinking like all the stuff that I had been through in my career, you know, I've been stabbed, gun battles, like all this stuff. And I'm gonna wind up smothering to death in this, this office because we can't get out. And all of a sudden, um, a side door opened and these two maintenance guys showed up. And they were probably as shocked to see the mayor, the police commissioner, the fire commissioner and see all of us in that room. They were about as shocked to see us as I was to see them. And uh, I asked them, you have keys to get us out. We wanted to go west. I wanted to get out the other side of the building. And they took us out a series of hallways all the way east until we came out on Church Street. That's how we actually got out of the building. And I remember walking into that lobby and looking outside and you could not see anything outside. It was pure white. It was like somebody took a sheet and put it in front of the window and I thought, what is that? Like, what is, what's out there? What happened? You know, was it a nuclear blast? Like, what was this? And, uh, and they had these rotating doors, these circular rotating doors. And I remember going through the door, getting outside. And when we got outside, there was no sound. sirens, no birds, no car horns, no city sound, no sound, period. It was just like somebody stuck you in a soundproof booth. That's how condensed this dust and soot and gas was. Um, it took out all sound, you know, and keep in mind, I was four or five blocks from the towers. The men and women of the New York City Police Department, the Fire Department, and the Port Authority Police affected the greatest rescue mission in the history of the country. They took 20 to 25,000, maybe 30,000 people out of these buildings in this surrounding area. 
But then they also evacuated close to a million people out of southern Manhattan, out of, from, from 14th Street down to Battery Park, close to a million people were evacuated. And they were evacuated into Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, New Jersey, with the help of the New Jersey State Police, the Newark Police Department, the Jersey City Police Department. Everybody came together. Um, there was unity like we haven't seen in years. Um, there was resilience um, that we barely see these days. Um, and it was, uh, it was a feat, I think, for the first responders. Never been replicated prior and hopefully it's, it's never gonna happen again. I think one of the things that, that differentiated um, New York City and, and what we were doing, what happened on that day to other municipalities, even state governments around the country. From 1996 to 2000, for four years, Rudy Giuliani created the Office of Emergency Management in the event of a crisis, an emergency in the city. And for those four years, four and a half years, we constantly practiced um, for crisis, right? Trying to be proactive. Mock drills, tabletop exercises. And I would get a call on Saturday morning and they'd say that the mayor just called a mock drill, tabletop exercise for a, uh, for a biochemical attack in the subway. At the time, I ran Rikers Island. I was the correction commissioner and I would think, I run the jail system, like it has nothing to do with me. But we had to go anyway. And on September 11th, all that training, everything that we had done for four and a half years paid off. Managing a crisis is probably one of the most important elements of something like this that you can imagine because it ensures that you're getting everything done. There has to be an assurance that one, you're getting stuff done, and two, the people are being held accountable if they're not. It was a moment where you, you just, it just awakens you to what the, the really dark side of the human experience can show and then it shows you the lightest side, the brightest side, the best out of people. I'll never forget, I made a big deal of it at the time. So the days after, there was soot and ash and I was there and I was reporting from there and doing TV from there and radio from there and walking up and you're just looking up at this mass of rubble. But then amazing thing happened. New Yorkers are not exactly known for their Southern charm and hospitality. But Campbell Soup sets up an entire soup kitchen, all free. Anybody wants it, come eat. Stores, restaurants, they all opened up their doors. Everything was free. The fire department's first deputy, chief of department, chief of operations, chaplain, when we met with them on West Street and we left, Tower 2 imploded about 50 minutes later. Every one of the guys we were with died. When Tower um, 2 imploded. When Tower 2 imploded. So, uh, you what know. You had just spoken to them before that. We had just spoken to them. We had just spoken to them. In fact, uh, the chief of operations told us, he said, look, I don't think we have to worry about the towers coming down. He said, but we're going to lose everybody and everything above the impact zone. So in Tower 1, the impact zone was around the 95th floor. Tower 2 was around the 75th floor. Um, so we anticipated there's going to be a lot of death and destruction in the top of the buildings. What nobody anticipated was the jet fuel was going to create an inferno. It was going to weaken the beams. And because the beams were so heavy, the structure wouldn't be able to hold it. And once they started to implode and collapse, they just came straight down. There was nothing stopping. There were pockets and voids underground where you would hope somebody got into, but you also had to keep in mind that it was close to 2,000 degrees, between 1,500 and 2,000 degrees underground, where these fires were still burning. 
The fires lasted for almost three months. Three months. Yeah. And uh, we kept the rescue going for about four weeks, four or five weeks, and then it turned into a straight recovery case. Um, and the recovery was difficult uh, for a number of reasons, but most importantly, it was, you know, digging and, and getting down deep into the voids, um, but you had to remove a billion pounds of debris, right? And those beams, when you remember the beams that were sticking out of the, the ground at the time that held up the towers, the beams that the towers were made out of, they were about 1,700 pounds per linear foot. Wow. So if this stuff shifted, if anything moved, if that stuff fell, you know, it was gonna kill somebody. So you couldn't have, you couldn't have guys on the ground constantly. Uh, what we started doing at the end, uh, you know, probably two months in, basically put a bunch of construction equipment down there, started moving the debris, and as that debris moved, we had spotters with binoculars. If they saw a body or a piece of a body or some human remains in some capacity, um, then they shut everything down, they stopped movement, and we basically went in and found or pulled out what they found. Keep in mind, we lost, uh, we lost 400 first responders, 23 cops, 37 Port Authority cops, 343 firefighters. The reality is many of them, I would say most of them, disintegrated. The first two cops, I think, that we did find, my guys, out of the 23 we lost, um, they, you know, when I got down to, the, uh, to ground zero, there were two Home Depot buckets, and in those buckets were the, the remaining pieces of a Glock, an exploded magazine, a set of handcuffs. Um, anything that was metal was there for these two cops. But I mean, think of this for a second. A bulletproof vest, a leather belt, boots, uniform, the body itself, gone. The only thing that survived was metal. And that was the only remains we had. It was like they were never there. It's not really a rescue anymore, it's a recovery. So over the course of the next, I don't know, uh, until May of 2002, it was a recovery operation where we just were digging to recover anybody who was lost so that we could return the remains to their families, uh, give them some sort of closure. We were digging, me and my brother would go down and we would dig to recover the remains of my father and hopefully uh, be the ones to carry him out. And that was, that was the intent, was if, we, if they found him or if someone found him, we wanted to, we wanted to put the flag over the, over the Stokes basket and carry him out ourselves. Um, and we dug until May, until the, until the floor was broom swept and there was nothing else to look through. And unfortunately, we didn't find any remains. We only found his halligan or his officer's tool which had an R4 uh, engraved in it for Rescue 4 and a KD for Kevin Dowdell. So we knew that was his. We, we recovered that uh, about two weeks after the collapse. And uh, that's unfortunately all, all we recovered from the, from the site. The first firemen that arrived here, the first cops that arrived, you know, the, the station house that's right around the corner from yeah. the museum, those guys went into the towers. They were 50 floors up. 60 floors up in the tower. Um, tower two imploded. There was an evacuation call. And, and this talks, I think this talks a lot about the service of the people that were here that day. When the evacuation call was given, a lot of people evacuated. But I have to tell you, a lot of people didn't. I think a lot of people, first responders, I think a lot of them died because they knew people were still in those buildings and they wanted them out. Um, and it just shows you the, the, the dedication, the perseverance, the courage, the hero, heroism um, that was involved. You know, it was the perils inherent with what you were doing, with the death and destruction of what was going on. Um, it was obvious. So for those men and women that stayed down here and continued on in the rescue and recovery efforts, 
that's heroism that, uh, you know, I, I don't think has ever been replicated. I don't think we'll, you know, hopefully we don't ever have to see it again. But you have to give the men and women uh, in the first, uh, the first responders that were down there an enormous amount of credit for doing what they did. On the morning of September 12th, there was just one thing in this country, and it was American. You know, I told you earlier this story uh, with the president. You know, the president came to Ground Zero. He, um, he toured Ground Zero. You know, if you recall, he stood out there with the bullhorn with the, the retired firemen and, you know, talked to the, the firefighters and the, and the first responders. And then we all jumped in the president's suburban. And we headed uptown to the Javits Center so he could see the families of, the, uh, of those that were missing. And he was so impressed with the thousands of people along the route to the Javits Center. Big signs, you know, God bless America. And at some point he says, you know, he's just so impressed with all this unity. And Mayor Giuliani looked at him and laughed. He said, Mr. President, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but nobody out there voted for you. He goes, we're on the west side of Manhattan. There are no Republicans, but it didn't make a difference. There were no political parties in, in the United States. There were none. You were American, but it took a tragedy. Is that what it really takes for us to unite and come together? You would think not, you would hope not. Um, I'm not sure. Thank you for making the nation proud, and may God bless America.